I understand that some of the voting members don't have or having problems raising their hand. Um, if that problem continues, uh, please just speak out um, and I will call on you. Um, so that make sure that you all have a chance to ask your questions, uh, but we'll look into that. Um, so we'll move forward now with the pneumococcal vaccines uh, presentation. And um, if I could ask uh, Dr. Paling to please uh, um, give the introduction. Dr. Paling. Okay, um, thank you very much. So I wanna share the pneumococcal vaccines work group on the next slide, please. Um, I need to start with a very um, sincere thank you to all the members of the pneumococcal vaccine work group. Um, as we will discuss on the information that we have, we've had to double the frequency of our meetings to be able to accomplish um, the goals and have robust discussions. So a sincere thanks to all the ACIP members, the ex officio, the liaison representatives and consultants, and a special thanks to our CDC lead, Nwako Kobayashi, who has really helped us keep on track and um, also made this a lot of fun. The next page. And we need to also acknowledge the tremendous work that all of our CDC contributors and our grade and evidence to recommendation consultants have done um, to enable this presentation today. Next slide, please. So as a refresher, we currently have two vaccines that are licensed, the 23-valent pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, which we will refer to as PPSV23, made by Merck, and then we have the 13-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which we'll refer to as PCV13, made by Pfizer. And the reason this work group is working is there's two new vaccines that are coming. One is the 20-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine that we'll refer to, um, that we'll need to refer to as PCV20 and um, made by Pfizer. It was just licensed for use in adults over age 18 years and older on June 8, 2021. And then the 15-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, PCV15 made by Merck, and the BLA has been filed to the FDA and is anticipated that licensure for adults will be coming in July 2021. Next slide, please. Okay, um, the current adult pneumococcal vaccine recommendations are not simple. Um, for persons without um, chronic medical conditions, or immunocompromising conditions, there is no recommendation for persons 19 to 64 years of age. For all persons over, oops, back up. Thank you. For all persons over 65 years of age, um, PCV13 is recommended based on shared clin clinical decision making and then PPSV23 for all. Chronic medical conditions, PPSV23 for 19 to 64, and PCV13 based on shared clinical decision making and PPSV23. For cochlear implants and CSF leak, um, the recommendation for 19 to 64 and over 65 is PCV13 based on shared clinical decision making and PPSV23. And then immunocompromising conditions, it's both the PPSV13 uh, and 23. So the next slide. Um, so as we were working towards the um, making a cost effectiveness analysis, we tried to simplify um, the recommendations. So you can see no recommendation for 16 to 24, PPSV based on uh, shared clinical decision making, and PPSV 23 for all over 65 in none of the conditions in for a chronic medical condition, only the um, 19 to 64 with chronic medical conditions have PPSV 23 only, and then the same recommendation of PCV 13 and PPSV 23 series for cochlear implant and immunocompromising conditions. Next slide, please. 
So the guiding principles proposed by the work group were the following four. First, decisions on policy options should be supported by best available evidence. Second, simplification of the pneumococcal vaccine recommendations um, are desirable and might improve uptake. Third, disparities in pneumococcal burden, disease burden and vaccine coverage should be reduced with the goal of being eliminated. And uh, fourth, timely recommendations for each new vaccine should be made after FDA licensure. Next slide, please. So the over, oops, I'm sorry, back up one. Um, the overarching policy questions under consideration by the work group that were presented at the February meeting are the following. Should PCB15 be routinely recommended in adults aged over 50 or 65 years? Should PCB15 be recommended in younger adults with underlying medical conditions? Should PCB20 be routinely recommended in adults over age 50 or over 65? Should PCB20 be recommended in younger adults with underlying medical conditions? And then should recommendations be made for PCB15 and PCB20 alone in series with PC, PPSV23? So the next slide. All right, so we, um, an important component of the work was to look at the policy options for cost-effectiveness analysis. There were eight strategies that were compared to the current pneumococcal vaccine recommendations. So strategy A was PCV15 uh, for 19 to 64-year-olds with underlying conditions and then for over 65 years of age. Uh, an age-based recommendation over 65. Strategy B was PCV20, 19 to 64, with underlying conditions, and then an age-based over 65. Strategy C was the PPSV and PPSV23 for 19 to 64 underlying conditions, as well as an age-based over 65. And then strategy D was PCV20 and 23, uh, PPSV23, um, for 19 to 64-year-olds with underlying conditions, and then again, an age-based over 65. Those same four strategies were then also evaluated, lowering the age-based recommendation to 50 years and looking at 19 to 49 years with underlying conditions. Next slide, please. So um, we are going to be presenting the results of the cost-effectiveness analysis an estimated public health impact from each policy option. And so I am giving, I want to um, orient you as to what the work group has identified as the um, following four options that we're focusing on. It's the PCB15 for 19 to 64 and um, age-based over 65, PCB20 with the same recommendation, and then the PPS, uh, PCB15 plus um, PPSV23 for 19 to 64 and um, age base of over 65. And for um, and then we're also looking at PCV20 for over age 50 and for um, 19 to 49 underlying conditions. Next slide, please. All right. So the grade of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation. PCV15 and 20, the new vaccines are under consideration. Licensure is based on non-inferior immunogenicity compared to um, current vaccines. It's PCV13 and PPSV23 for non-PCV13 serotypes. There is no efficacy data. Um, and then um, PCV13 and PPSV data on efficacy and effectiveness against disease outcomes um, that what was available has also been looked at. So um, to highlight, PCV13 and PSV23 data re was reviewed for background, and the grade is based on PCV15 and PCV20 immunogenicity studies. Next slide, please. All right, so today we are going to um, have an update on the epidemiology of pneumococcal disease in U.S. adults by Mr. Ryan Gerke, a cost-effectiveness analysis of PCV15 and 20 
Youth and Adults by Dr. Charles Stoker, Grade for Age-Based PCV15 and PCV20 Use in U.S. Adults by Ms. Jennifer Ferrar, and Evidence to Recommendation Summary of Age-Based PCV15 and PCV20 Use in Adults by Dr. Mwako Kobayashi, as well as a summary and timeline. So what we're going to be focusing on in this meeting is the age-based recommendation. Next slide, please. And the reason for this is here is our initial proposed timeline, remembering that we reviewed the epidemiology of current U.S. pneumococcal disease vaccine products in a summary of phase three results, as well as the policy questions in February. And um, in June, we said we were going to do the cost-effectiveness analysis and evidence to recommendation and grade to prepare us for a licensure in October. Next slide, please. Because of the volume of data and to maintain the robust discussions, we have um, proposed an alternative. What we're doing is going to review the cost effectiveness analysis and the public health impact in the grade and evidence to recommendation for PCV 1520 in, um, by a, for an age group based recommendation over 50 as well as over 65. In September, there will be an additional meeting so that we can compare the cost effectiveness and additional cost effectiveness analysis and then do the same thing with grade and evidence to recommendation based on underlying conditions so that we will still be on target to have an October vote. So thank you, and I will turn it over to Mr. Ryan Gerke. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paling. Um, so next we'll have updates on epidemiology of invasive pneumococcal disease in U.S. adults. Uh, Mr. Gerke, please. Thank you and good morning. When we presented the current epidemiology of pneumococcal disease at the February ACIP meeting, data on rates of invasive pneumococcal disease were available through 2018. With 2019 data now available, I will update the committee on current disease trends. We'll start with the impact of PCV13 on IPD incidence and serotype distribution in the United States. Current pneumococcal vaccines in use and serotypes covered by each are presented in this table. 13-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, or PCV13, covers 13 serotypes highlighted in yellow in the table. In the analysis I will present, we grouped serotype 6C with PCV13 serotypes due to cross-protection from 6A antigen included in the vaccine. A 23-valent polysaccharide vaccine, or PPSV23, contains 11 serotypes not included in PCV13, shown here in the red box. We'll refer to these 11 unique serotypes as PPSV23, non-PCV13. Data on IPD are obtained from the Active Bacterial Core Surveillance System, or ABCs. ABCs is a population-based active surveillance at 10 sites across the U.S. Cases are defined as pneumococcus isolated from a normally sterile site and residents of the 10 surveillance areas. Isolates are serotyped at reference laboratories using whole genome sequencing, quellung, or PCR, and serotypes are grouped for analysis by vaccine type. U.S. Census Bureau estimates were used as denominators to calculate incidence rates for overall and serotype-specific IPD as cases per 100,000. This graph shows updated incidence rates of IPD among children under 5 from 2007 through 2019. After introduction of PCV13 in 2010, rates of PCV13 type IPD shown here in orange declined sharply. Comparing 2007 and 2008 rates to the 2018 and 2019 rates, we observed an almost 90% reduction in PCV13 type IPD which resulted in a 67% reduction in overall IPD, shown here in blue, over the same time period. After 2013, declines in PCV13 type IPD rates plateaued at less than two cases per 100,000, and this trend continued through 2019. Rates of non-PCV13 serotypes in black remained relatively stable over this time period, and were not observing replacement disease by non-vaccine serotypes in children. Here are the updated incidence rates for adults aged 19 to 49, shown on left, and ages 50 to 64 on the right. 
PCV13 type rates declined in both age groups after PCV13 introduction in children due to the indirect effects of the vaccine. This led to a decline in overall IPD. However, declines in PCV13 type IPD plateaued around 2014 and rates remained stable through 2019. PPSV23 non-PCV13 type IPD shown in gray and non-vaccine type rates shown in yellow have been relatively stable for both age groups in recent years and this trend has continued through 2019. Among adults aged 65 and older, as with younger adults, after introduction of PCV13 in children, we see a decrease in rates of PCV13 serotypes, which drives a decrease in overall rates of IPD. Please note the change in y-axis here as older adults have uh, overall higher disease rates than younger adults and children. Declines in PCV13 type rates plateaued after 2014, around the same time as younger adults, and again this trend has continued through 2019. No additional declines in PCV13 type IPD have been observed after PCV13 was recommended for adults aged 65 years and older in late 2014. PPSV23 non-PCV13 types and non-vaccine type rates of disease remain stable. We examined updated IPD rates for individual serotypes in PCV13 plus 6C among children less than 5 from 2011 through 2019. The serotypes in the original 7-valent conjugate vaccine are grouped together in gray, except for 19F, which is shown in yellow. After PCV13 introduction in children, rates of disease declined for many PCV13 serotypes. However, reductions were not seen in serotype 3, shown in green, or 19F. In 2018 through 2019, we continued to see serotype 3 and 19F make up most of the remaining PCV13 type disease in children, together accounting for almost 80% of remaining disease. Rates of 19A, shown in reddish-brown, continue to decline but still account for 14% of remaining disease. Similar trends are observed among adults aged 65 years and older. Again, note the increase in y-axis due to higher incidence rates. Proportions of remaining disease in 2018 and 2019 are similar to what we observed for years 2017 and 2018, with serotype 3 now accounting for 62% of remaining PCV13 type disease. Serotype 6C shown in purple accounting for 12%, and serotypes 19F and 19A each accounting for around 10% of remaining disease. Among ages 19 to 64, trends in incidence rates for individual PCV13 plus 6C serotypes were similar to what we observed for children and adults 65 years and older. In terms of remaining PCV13 type disease in 2018 and 2019, among both 19 to 49 year olds and 50 to 64 year olds, serotype 3 was still the most common PCV13 serotype, with serotypes 19F and 19A also contributing to remaining PCV13 type disease. In February, one difference we noted among these age groups compared to older adults and children is that serotype 4 has increased recently. In 2018-2019, it made up 26% of remaining PCV13 type disease in adults 19-49 and 12% in adults 50-64, where it has surpassed 19A compared to data available in 2017 and 2018, so this trend has continued. We'll now examine the current IPD burden among PCV15 and PCV20 serotypes. This table shows the serotypes contained in the three different conjugate vaccines, as well as PPSV23. Serotypes covered by PCV13 are again shown in yellow. Additional serotypes covered by new conjugate vaccines, PCV15 and PCV20, are shown in green. PCV15 contains the 13 serotypes in PP and PCV13 plus the two additional serotypes 22F and 33F. For analysis purposes, we will refer to these two serotypes as PCV15, non-PCV13. PCV20 contains the 15 serotypes also included in PCV15 plus five additional serotypes, which are 8, 10A, 11A, 12F, and 15B slash C. 15B and 15C are indistinguishable and grouped together here. 
we will refer to these five serotypes as P PCV20, non-PCV15. Finally, there are four remaining serotypes unique to PPSV23 shown in orange, and we will refer to these as PPSV23, non-PCV20. Here are the updated incident rates for serotypes in the three different conjugate vaccine formulations among adults aged 19 to 64 years old from 2011 through 2019. Ages 19 to 49 are shown on the left and ages 50 to 64 on the right. PCV13 type IPD is shown in blue. PCV15 non-PCV13 serotypes shown in orange continue to remain stable in recent years and in 2018 through 2019 contributed to about half a case per 100,000 for adults 19 to 49 years and two cases per 100,000 for adults 50 to 64 years of age. PCV20 non-PCV15 serotypes shown in light gray also remain stable and in 2018 through 2019 contributed to about one case per 100,000 among adults 19 to 49 and three cases per 100,000 for adults aged 50 to 64 years. Similar trends are observed in ages 65 and older over the same time period. Again, note the uh, larger y-axis. In 2018 through 2019, PCV15 non-PCV13 types contributed 3.6 cases per 100,000 and 3.2 cases per 100,000 for PCV20 non-PCV15 type disease. This graph shows the proportion of IPD by vaccine type for various groups updated for years 2018 through 2019. PCV13 types are shown in the bottom in light blue. PCV15 non-PCV13 type disease in orange accounted for 12 to 17% of IPD, while PCV20 non-PCV15 type disease shown in gray accounted for an additional 14 to 22% of IPD. If we look at uh, PCV20 non-PCV13 serotypes, which includes the two additional serotypes also in PCV15, highlighted here in the black boxes, this accounted for 29 to 39% of disease. P PPSV23 non-PCV20, shown in yellow, accounted for 1 to 15% of IPD, depending on the age group with adults 19 to 49 and 50 to 64 having higher proportions of PPSV23 non-PCV20 compared to older adults and children less than five. Non-vaccine types in dark blue accounted for 23 to 38% of IPD. Finally, while this presentation focused on IPD, we also updated the estimate proportion of vaccine type pneumococcal pneumonia using data from a multi-center surveillance study of hospitalized pneumonia using Pfizer's serotype-specific urine antigen detection, or SSUAD. SSUAD can detect the 23 vaccine serotypes. Please note the proportion on the y-axis are out of all-cause pneumonia. Two time periods were available, October 2013 through September 2016, and November 2019 through December 2020. Also note that the more recent time period was during the pandemic and, so, and had a significantly smaller sample size. Data are courtesy of Pfizer. Among PCV13 serotypes shown in blue, serotype 3 noted on this table remained around 1% of all-cause pneumonia during both time periods, while the proportion of other PCV13 type serotypes was lower in 2020. PPSV20 non-PCV15 type disease in gray also accounted for a lower proportion of all-cause pneumonia in 2020, around 1%. The proportions for PCV15 non-PCV13 types in orange and PPSV23 non-PCV20 in yellow remained consistent, each accounting for around 1% of all-cause pneumonia. The additional data available for 2019 has not changed the conclusions reached previously. Among, among children and adults, overall and PCV13 type IPD incidence has plateaued since around 2013 or 2014. Incidence of invasive disease caused by PCV15 and PCV20 serotypes has also remained stable. And there are still opportunities to prevent an additional 30% of IPD burden among adults through new PCV use. 
thank you for your time and um, I'll open up for questions. Is it, oh, no, not right now. Thank you for that presentation, uh, Mr. Gerke. Um, so we're going to hold right now on questions and move on to the next presentation by uh, Dr. Stalker on the cost effectiveness of PCV15 and PCV20 use in U.S. adults. Uh, Dr. Stalker. Um, hi, uh, my name is Charles Stecker. I'm from Tulane University, and I'm here to present the economic uh, assessment of PCV15 and PCV20. Um, and I have no conflicts to declare. So uh, we're going to look at uh, evaluating the cost effectiveness of using either PCV15 or PCV20 in adults. Um, and then we're going to evaluate adding PPSV23 to either of those two recommendations. Um, we're going to look at the program costs and savings. We're going to look at the changes in um, disease, in medical costs, in uh, non-medical costs. Uh, we're going to look at this from the societal perspective. That means we're going to try to account for, for all possible costs. Um, our population is going to be a cohort of 19-year-olds, uh, a little over 4 million. Um, we're going to look at uh, separate model buckets uh, for three groups. We're going to look at the immunocompromised. Those are uh, people with uh, HIV, uh, cancer, um, who have had organ transplants or are on dialysis. We're going to look at people with chronic medical conditions, so those include diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, liver disease, and alcoholism. And then other people, we're going to consider them healthy, though they may have conditions not listed here. Um, so uh, as was highlighted before, there are eight strategies to evaluate. Um, we're going to look at the two uh, conjugate vaccines, the PCV15 and the PCV20. Uh, we're going to look at each of those at age 50 and age 65, so that's four. Um, and then we're going to look at adding the polysaccharide to each of those four recommendations, so that's eight total. Um, and then we're going to compare those to the current recommendations, which is uh, PCV13 at the diagnosis of immunocompromising condition, uh, the polysaccharide eight weeks later, and the second dose of the polysaccharide five, five years after that, if you're still under age 65, um, the polysaccharide at diagnosis of a chronic medical condition, um, and then PCV13 under shared clinical decision-making um, at age 65, and PPSV23 one year later. So as I said, this is a cohort model. We're going to look at cost per quality adjusted life year gained. Um, uh, and then we're also going to look at cost per life year gained as summary measures. Uh, we're going to use a cohort of 19-year-olds. We're going to compare each recommendation to the status quo and calculate the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, uh, divide the changing costs by the change in quality adjusted life years. All costs are going to be in April 2021 dollars inflated by the healthcare component of the personal uh, consumption expenditures. Uh, and then all outcomes are going to be discounted by 3%. The, outcomes, the health outcomes we're going to look at are cases of invasive pneumococcal disease, uh, cases of hospitalized uh, non-bacteremic pneumonia, cases of outpatient non-bacteremic pneumonia, deaths due to IPD, deaths due to NBP, um, and then the qualities are going to be summary measures of each of those, and then life years would just uh, be uh, summary measures of the deaths. Uh, so for the conceptual model, we're going to look at some po study population. We're going to... Uh, run the model twice, looking at some particular schedule, usually the new conjugate schedule compared to the existing schedule. Uh, people are going to get vaccinated and, and non-vaccinated, and if you're vaccinated, you can get uh, invasive disease, which will result in an inpatient visit or a death. Uh, you're going to get, uh, or, or both, I guess. Uh, you're going to look at um, non-bacteremic pneumonia, which uh, could result in inpatient visits, outpatient visits, or death. Um, and then no pneumococcal diseases, but there could be some background mortality. Uh, so going over some inputs uh, relatively quickly, but just to highlight how the model's set up here. Uh, so we've got our three uh, buckets of the population on the left side. So we've got the, the healthy population, the chronic medical condition population, and the immunocompromised condition uh, for the CAP hospitalization rates. Uh, those are broken into 19 to 49, 50 to 64, 65 to 74, and 75 plus. Uh, so for the IPD rates, 
Um, again, we have we have some similar breakdowns. Um, just to note that the IPD rates are much lower than the cap hospitalization rates, uh, so it's probably the cap that's going to drive them all. Uh, we're looking at serotype distributions for um, each of these uh, age buckets and for each um, uh, uh, serotype bucket and for each population. So the the data is is as diced uh, probably as thin as it can possibly go here. Um, I, I would say on, on average, the, um, the numbers that Ryan showed earlier hold, though there are some exceptions if you look more finely within each of these categories. Uh, but generally, there's a substantial amount of serotype 3 disease that, that remains. Um, there is uh, maybe a, uh, about uh, an equal amount of PCV20 only types compared to PCV15 only types. Um, compared to PCV13 types. Um, right, and so then we have this for the healthy and the, the IC and the CMC. Uh, right, and so this is just for the immunocompromised. Um, so for vaccine effectiveness, we assume generally the same vaccine for uh, vaccine effectiveness for the healthy and the CMC population, uh, and then we assume uh, a vaccine effectiveness that's about a, a third lower for the immunocompromised. Um, we do assume, uh, uh, you know, re relatively high vaccine effectiveness of of PCV versus vaccine type invasive pneumococcal disease, uh, except for serotype three, where in our base case we assume uh, a vaccine effectiveness that's about a, a third as low as what we assume it for the other serotypes. Um, we assume a slightly ho lower um, uh, vaccine effectiveness among the, the conjugate vaccines against vaccine type uh, non-bacteremic pneumonia for the healthy, um, though for the CMC we do assume uh, one that's, that's, that's uh, about, about a, maybe on the order of a half of what we assume for um, the effectiveness against IPD, um, other, other serotypes. Uh, for the vaccine effectiveness against serotype 3, uh, we assume a much smaller vaccine effectiveness. You can see it there in the third to last line, about 15.6% um, for the PCVs in the, in the base case, though we'll look at some alternative analyses around this. Um, for the polysaccharide, um, you can see the vaccine effectiveness numbers there, but, but lower than the, the conjugate vaccine effectiveness. Uh, so for coverage rates, um, we're deriving these from, from existing data and, and making some, some uh, analogies. So for the risk-based recommendations, we assume 23.3% uh, coverage rates uh, based on um, NHS 2018 data. Um, for the age-based recommendations at 50, um, we look at uh, the, the mean of the NIH covers rates for, for zoster um, and in the age-based uh, zoster at, at 60 to 64. Um, and then the age-based recommendations at, at, at age 65. Um, for the age-based recommendations at 65, uh, we rely on existing sources and come up with a coverage rate of about 46%. Uh, um, and then for the age-based recommendations at 65 for the polysaccharide, uh, we look at, um, again, existing data sources and come up with about 55.15%. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of different ways um, to model herd effects. Uh, so these are this is indirect protection coming from a potential childhood program. Um, so our base case won't assume any uh, herd effects from a from a PCV15 or PCV20 campaign in children. Uh, but when we do assume those, we're going to apply serotype specific uh, declines observed in the PCV13 types. Um, adding in, piece, uh, in serotype 6C, but not looking at trends in serotypes 3 or 19F in adults after PCV13 introduction in children. So we're going to argue by analogy um, from what happened in PCV13 in, a, in adults uh, might happen uh, to the PCV15 and PCV20 unique types in adults after a, a campaign in children. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll kind of like look ahead and we'll apply those additional, um, those herd impacts to PCV15 types starting in 2023, um, and then apply the, uh, P, uh, the declines to PCV20 types starting in 2024. Um, and I said, we'll, we'll run this with and without those, those herd impacts. Uh, so each um, health encounter is gonna be associated with, with qualities lost. So these are quality adjusted life years. 
Um, these are ways to capture the, the, the discomfort and suffering incurred by these conditions um, in an aggregate measure. Uh, so the qualities are on the in, the in the second column there. So for a case of invasive pneumococcal disease, uh, costs 0 0.0709 qualies. Um, that's equivalent to about 25 healthy days lost. Um, uh, we, we assume the same number for um, a hospitalized stay with non-bacterium pneumonia, um, and then a much lower quality loss for an outpatient non-bacterium pneumonia encounter. Um, the implied duration of, of hospitalization based on, based on these numbers is about 32 days. We look at a few different waning assumptions for the, um, the conjugate vaccines. Uh, first, across all scenarios, we assume there's no decline in effectiveness until age 65. Uh, uh, we look at two scenarios after age 65. So scenario one is a 10% decline every five years starting at age 65, um, uh, and that's by assumption. And then um, in the second scenario we look at, we look at a linear decline to zero between age 70 and 85. Uh, for the polysaccharide, uh, the declines in effectiveness start at vaccination, and so we, uh, we model a linear decline to 50% of the initial vaccine effectiveness over the first five years, a decline to 30% of the initial over the next five years, and then um, the remaining uh, vaccine effectiveness wanes, wanes over the next five years. Um, and this is uh, a graphical uh, depiction of what happens in each of those cases. Uh, so we're looking, and these are these are modeling the age-based recommendations. Um, so for vaccination at 50, um, under um, the uh, well, the the assumptions about the polysaccharide vaccine um, are that it's going to you know uh, wane as per the red line, uh, where it goes to 50% of its initial over the over the next five years. Um, for the uh, the conjugate vaccines neither starts uh, a decline until age 65, so they stay up there at 100% of their initial uh, vaccine effectiveness. Um, in the yellow line, that's the one where they decline linearly between uh, age 70 and 85. Um, and then the, the green line is they, they wane 10% for five years. Um, and then similar things at, at age 65, but the, but the declines start um, in, the, in the green line at age 65, and then the, the yellow line only waits five years. Uh, so here are the inputs that the model used for vaccine price. Um, the, the conjugate vaccines, uh, we used uh, numbers that are all about the same. These are from communications with manufacturers. Uh, and then the polysaccharide is about half of those. Um, we also included some costs for administering the vaccines uh, separately for, for 1964 and 65 plus. Um, and then we also accounted for some patient and travel time costs. Um, here are the, uh, the inputs for disease costs. Uh, again, looking se separately at the, at the three populations, um, those who are otherwise healthy, those with chronic medical conditions, and the immunocompromised. Uh, for the costs, we, we looked at three different age buckets, 1949, 50 to 64, and 65 plus. Um, and then we looked at our three different health outcomes on the left side there. So, uh, for instance, the way to, the way to read this is that um, uh, a case of IPD in the 19 to 49 age group costs $57,000. Um, and then the 95% um, confidence interval, which we got by, by bootstrapping the data, um, is there in parentheses. We're gonna look at five different scenarios. Um, so we'll, we'll look at the base case, um, and then we'll look at uh, a scenario where we assume that the, all of the conjugate vaccines have no effectiveness against serotype three. Um, we're going to look at a, uh, uh, another scenario called short-run herd effects, um, and this, this is going to model that, take that decline that we, we saw from adults in PCV13 types uh, and apply it to PCV15 and PCV20 unique types. Um, and uh, we're calling this short-run herd effects because we're trying to get, like, what's going to happen over the short run. And, and so we're going to uh, start the decline at, at, at age 53 for vaccination at age 50. Uh, so the, the model is run on a cohort of 19-year-olds, um, but but applying those those uh, those uh, serotype declines starting at age 53 uh, means we can model something closer to like a, a catch-up campaign. So if we we recommended the 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 uh, the vaccine strategies for people who are age 50 now rather than um, starting the 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 recommendations for a cohort of 19-year-olds now. 
Um, uh, so those will start at eight, the, the PCV15 de, uh, declines would start at age 53 for the, the vaccine strategies that recommend vaccination at age 50. Um, the PCV20 declines would start at age 54 for the vaccination strategies that, um, that are also at age 50. Uh, for the strategies at age 65, those start at age 68 and age 69 for PCV15 and PCV20 types, respectively. The, um, the fourth uh, scenario we'll look at is with that, that steeper waning. So um, the, the base case was uh, the, the line where the PCV types had a 10% decline per five years starting at age 65. Um, alternatively, we look at this, this uh, linear decline in effectiveness between age 70 and 85. Um, and then the last case we look at is uh, particular to PCV15. Uh, so we assume that it has um, protections uh, on the order of, of, of two to three times higher than what we assume uh, the conjugate vaccines do in the, in the base case listed there. All right, so these are the outputs from all of those, uh, those scenarios. Um, so each cell in this, um, this chart is uh, a cost effectiveness ratio. So the, the dollars per quality adjusted life year gained um, so looking down column one, so these are the results under those five different scenarios for administering the conjugate vaccine um, at, at age 50 uh, and diagnosis of, of Im immunocompromising or chronic medical condition. Uh, so under the base case assumption, it costs $282,000 per quality adjusted life year gained. Uh, but looking down at the next row, if we assume that the, the, the conjugate vaccines have no effect against serotype 3, um, then replacing the current recommendation costs about a, a million dollars per quality adjusted life year gained, uh, because recall we're, we're removing the polysaccharide. Um, if we assume that there are some short run hurt effects, it costs about $800,000 per quality adjusted life year gained. Uh, if we assume that there's some steeper waning, uh, then it costs about $600,000 per quality adjust, adjusted life year gained. Uh, but if we assume that it has that, uh, the, the 15 valent um, conjugate vaccine has that enhanced effectiveness against serotype 3, um, then it uh, costs $231,000 per quality adjusted life year gained. Uh, going on to column 2, uh, so the conjugate vaccine that's 20 valent when we administer at age 50 or at diagnosis of CMC or IC, um, in the base case, it's cost saving. That means that the medical costs that we save uh, are greater than the, the vaccine plus administration costs and patient time costs. Um, and that held even in the case where the, the, we assume that the conjugate vaccines have no effectiveness against serotype 3. Um, if we assume that there are some short-run hurt effects, so this is, again, trying to model that catch-up campaign, it costs about $24,000 per quality adjusted life year gained, um, though that, that falls to, to about $5,000 per life year gained if, there's, um, if we assume that there's steeper waning of the, the conjugate vaccine. So columns 3 and 4 are like columns one and two, but they add the polysaccharide vaccine to those. Um, and so what's, what's shown in columns three and four are the marginal uh, cost per qualities of the polysaccharide. So uh, if, we, if we start in a world where we, we have the, the 15 valent conjugate vaccine at age 50, and then we add the polysaccharide vaccine at, at age 50, um, then in the base case, adding that polysaccharide to that existing PCV15 recommendation costs $574,000 per quality. Um, so I won't go over these columns in detail, but I'll, I'll just summarize and say that, that these numbers are, are, are quite high. Um, everything is, is three, four hundred plus thousand dollars per quality adjusted life year gain. Uh, so skipping to column five, this is uh, administering the 15 valent conjugate vaccine at age 65. Um, in the base case, it costs $158,000 per quality adjusted life year gain, again, compared with current recommendations. Um, though if we assume that the, 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 conjugate vaccines have no effectiveness against serotype 3, then it's dominated by, by current recommendations, which means that it, it costs more than what we currently spend for the, the recommended vaccine uh, for this, this group um, and re results in, in, in less, less health outcomes. Um, it does look uh, worse if we assume that there's some short-run hurt effects or that there's some steeper waning, uh, but of course it looks, it looks much better if there's an enhanced, um, if PCV15 uh, is, is particularly effective against serotype 3. Uh, for the PCV20 at age 65, um, it was cost saving among um, all of the, the model assumptions given here. Um, and then again, looking at 7 and 8, so we're trying to add the polysaccharide to uh, the scenarios depicted in columns 5 and 6. 
So for instance, uh, column seven adds polysaccharide to that PCV15 at 865. Um, and again, you can see that, that adding the polysaccharide uh, to those conjugate vaccines doesn't look like a particularly uh, good deal economically. Uh, so here are the results from our base case model. Um, uh, so here you can look at the uh, marginal changes in our, in our health outcomes and our costs. Uh, so uh, there are four uh, strategies modeled on this slide. Um, the first column is looking at the administration of PCV15 at CMC or IC and H50. Um, and you can see that compared to the current recommendation, uh, this averts 153 um, invasive pneumococcal disease cases uh, and averts, uh, averts uh, 194 hospitalized pneumonia cases um, and uh, et cetera, on down the line. Um, the, uh, in total, this costs $55 million. Uh, that is uh, the combination of about $11 million saved in, in medical costs and about $66 million in vaccine plus administration plus patient time costs. Uh, so if we divide the qualities gained uh, by the costs, we come up with that $282,000 per quality that you saw on that initial summary slide. Um, skipping to column two, this is for uh, the 20-valent conjugate vaccine um, at age 50. Um, and uh, you can see that there's, there's savings. Uh, we avert a lot of uh, health outcomes, but skipping down to the costs, you can see that it saves us on net uh, $16 million. Um, uh, and that's because the, the medical cost savings of $85 million outweighs the, the vaccine cost of $69 million. So this is labeled a, a cost saving strategy under the model. Um, and then the, the third and fourth columns here are the incremental cost effectiveness ratio of adding the polysaccharide to what was either in column one or column two. Um, and then skipping down to the summary measures, you can see again that um, the, the uh, qualities averted are, are modest compared to the, the cost. Uh, so this repeats that previous slide in the base case, but now looking at those interventions um, where we change the age-based recommendation to age 65 as opposed to age 50. Um, again, uh, the 15-valent uh, polysaccharide recommendation to age 65 costs $158,000 per quality. The 20-valent uh, conjugate vaccine is cost-saving. Um, and again, you can see some details on the calculations that, that show that adding the polysaccharide to each of those under these assumptions um, is not particularly efficient. Uh, so these are um, outputs from the same model, but but uh, shown in different ways. So the number that you need to vaccinate to avert um, one hospitalization under the PCV15 uh, at age 50 scenario, you need to uh, vaccinate about 573 people um, to avert one um, case of, uh, of pneumococcal disease, you need to vaccinate 322 people. Uh, and to avert one death, you need to vaccinate uh, 6,968 uh, people. Um, and then you can see these numbers for each of the, the other strategies um, uh, as, as listed there. Uh, so this, this is similar to that previous slide. Again, just taking those, those outputs and presenting them in an alternate way. Um, so these are the costs per outcome averted. So how much we need to spend to avert one hospitalization under the PCV15 at age 50 scenario is $157,000. Uh, to avert one case, we need to spend $95,000. And to avert one death, we need to uh, spend $1.7 million. Um, uh, under the PCV20 uh, scenarios, these were cost saving, uh, again, because the, the cost that we spend on the, on the vaccine are outweighed by the, the net cost. Uh, that we save in the in medical system. Um, so this is a, a, a different scenario where we look at long run indirect effects. So recall that the short run indirect effects didn't kick in until age 50 or, or, or greater, or 53 or greater. Uh, so this, uh, this model assumes that the, um, the uh, herd effects start at age 19. So the, the model runs with a cohort of, of 19 year olds and as, as people age through the model, they experience increasing herd effects from the KID uh, program. Uh, so by the time that people are, are older, there's uh, substantial protection provided from, from that um, childhood immunization program. 
Uh, so that's uh, every year 4.1% of uh, existing uh, PCB20 or PCB15 unique types are, are, are removed um, from the adults. Um, and so this looks at um, just one particular scenario. So this is just looking at the conjugate, the 20 valent conjugate vaccine at age 65. Uh, which generally looks pretty good. It was it was cost saving through um, I think all of the all of the different model permutations we looked at so far. Um, and these are uh, this this is uh, iterating the model 50,000 times and looking at what percent of those runs are um, below certain thresholds or above certain thresholds. Uh, so just reading the summaries there, uh, about 70% of model iterations cost more than $100,000 per quality um, under these under this long run um, indirect effect scenario. Uh, about 61% of model iterations cost more than $200,000 per quality. 56% uh, cost more than $300,000 per quality. Um, and then almost 40% of model iterations were dominated by current recommendations. So that means that, um, you know, replacing the current recommendations with PCB20 at age 65, uh, in the context of long run herd effects from the KID program, uh, resulted in higher costs um, and lower health outcomes than the current recommendation. Uh, there is um, one existing study that's looked at PCV20 um, and PCV15 at age 65. Um, to, so to summarize the, the findings there, um, they, they found that uh, PCV20 cost about $173,000 per quality without indirect effects and uh, $449,000 per quality with indirect effects. Uh, so the, the study that I'm uh, presenting right now did not directly compare PCV15 and PCV20. Uh, in each of the columns showing PCV20 and PCV15 in this study, they're compared to the existing recommendation. Um, Smith et al. directly compared PCV15 and PCV20 and found that uh, PCV15 was dominated by PCV20, so it, it cost um, more and, and uh, resulted in a less healthy population, um, uh, and similar findings for the, the polysaccharide vaccine. Um, I, I will say that the key difference between the, the Smith study and the, and the current study, uh, other than how to present the PCV15 results, um, was that this study includes the risk-based recommendations bundled with the age-based, and the Smith study was looking at only a, a recommendation to age 65 in, in isolation. Uh, so it's important to acknowledge the limitations of a modeling study. Um, first, work loss was not considered here, which could potentially make... Um, uh, uh, change change some some results around. Uh, the model assumed that there's no uh, vaccine adverse events, um, and then there's substantial uncertainty around the influence of, say, the um, serotype three vaccine effectiveness. Uh, the uh, uncertainty around the impacts of a PCV15 or PCV20 child immunization program. Uh, we don't have really great data on vaccine waning. Uh, we assumed a couple of different scenarios for the conjugate here, uh, but those those may or may not be correct. Um, and then we also uh, could really use some, some more precise data on the vaccine preventable pneumonia burden, because what this study relies on is uh, multiplying the uh, rates of, of you know, uh, uh, pneumonia, pneumococcal disease times the, the serotype distributions of, of that disease. And we could have uncertain, uncertainty on either parts of that calculation. Uh, so with those caveats, Given those assumptions and limitations, uh, the conclusions that we could draw from this model are, first, that modeling indicates PCV20 was economically efficient at both ages 50 and 65 under several alternative scenarios. Uh, PCV15 modeling, model findings were more mixed, um, uh, though it did look better under the, the higher PCV15 vaccine effectiveness versus serotype 3. Um, this model did indicate that adding the polysaccharide vaccine to either the, the 15 or the 20 incurred high costs for minimal health gains. Um, and then, uh, but, but uh, PCV20 was less likely to be economic efficient under predicted indirect protection from the childhood programs. Um, and I only showed the PCV20 results here, but that would, that would hold for other vaccines and ages as well. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Stecker. Um, we're going to take a couple of questions right now uh, because this was a very data intense uh, presentation and uh, some of our members and liaisons may have questions. So I'm opening it up to questions at this time. Uh, 
I don't seem to be seeing any. Ah, yes, Dr. Lee, please. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Romero, can I just clarify, uh, do you only want questions um, for the cost effectiveness or is it um, also for the earlier presentations? No, it's only for the cost effectiveness at this moment and then, and then we'll move to the others. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that I just have a minor question, <laughs> which is um, for the uh, modeling assumptions, you had described that you were using a 19-year-old cohort um, and you described some of the, you know, the impact uh, at age 50 and 53 or 50 and 54. Uh, my question really has to do with discounting. So are you assuming those uh, cohorts start at age 19 or are you allowing sort of a cross-sectional look across various ages so that we can get a better sense just because I, I'm wondering if discounting would impact the benefits there. Uh, right, so this, this is a cohort of 19 year olds and it is discounted at 3% per year. So by the time you get to age 50 or 53, uh, those, those costs and outcomes are heavily discounted. Would it be, and does that include sort of the cases or when you present the, um, you know, cases and uh, the differential in cases, is, is that just absolute or is that also discounted? Cases are discounted as well. So every, uh, health outcomes and costs are all discounted. Yeah. So, so one perhaps suggestion or, or question I have is whether um, it would be helpful to do a cross-sectional look because, and, and the reason being that, um, this, these vaccines appear to offer potential direct protection. Um, uh, and also because of what you mentioned about, you know, you know, the impact of childhood vaccination programs are going to potentially be far greater than the direct impact we're seeing in the adult population. And so in, in the next, you know, X number of years until we have childhood vaccines available, um, it really is about that increment in the in-between. Um, and so using that discounting, I think we might not capture the full uh, degree of benefit in the next few years for the adult population. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goyazi wishes to make a comment, please. Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Romero. Um, um, so Dr. Lee, uh, just to um, add that, you know, we are considering, you know, looking at a separate model um, of older adults uh, so that we can, you know, look more, you know, specifically at the impact of this age-based recommendation. Um, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I feel off. My microphone is off. Um, are there any other questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Stecker. Um, we will move on now to um, the presentation by uh, Ms. Farrar on a grade for age-based PCV15 and PCV20 use in U.S. adults. Uh, Ms. Farrar, please. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Today I will present a review of evidence to grade regarding 15 and 20 valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine use in adults. Based on discussions from the pneumococcal work group and cost effective cost effectiveness analyses that were just presented, the work group focused grade and ETR on the following four policy options, which are highlighted in the red boxes. There are two strategies for PCV15, one with and one without P PPSV23, and two stra strategies for PCV20, one for adults 50 years and older and one for adults 65 years and older. I will first briefly review the methods for grade and the retrieval of evidence before presenting background evidence and the evidence to grade. In discussions regarding outcomes of importance, the pneumococcal work group members deemed vaccine type invasive pneumococcal disease, vaccine type pneumococcal pneumonia, and vaccine type death as critical outcomes to review. Overall pneumococcal infections caused by vaccine and non-vaccine serotypes were considered non-specific outcomes were not ranked as critical and will not be presented. There are currently no studies on PCV15 or PCV20 assessing these outcomes. Therefore, we reviewed the evidence on PCV15 and PCV20 immunogenicity data. We will also pre present a review of evidence on PCV13 and PPSV23 effectiveness against these clinical outcomes. However, this evidence was not used for grade. Regarding outcomes related to harms, work group members deemed serious adverse events of critical importance. 
Evidence on serious adverse events was available and reviewed for both P PCV15 and PCV20. After discussion with the pneumococcal work group, the following PICO questions were decided for PCV15 and PCV20 age based recommendations. There are two policy questions for PCV15 and two for PCV20. Three questions focus on adults 65 years and older and one on adults 50 years and older. All policy questions compare PCV15 or PCV20 to the current vaccine recommendations and review the outcomes vaccine type IPD, vaccine type non-bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia, mortality, and serious adverse events. Regarding PCV15, the first question shown in the first column is, should PCV15 be routinely recommended to U.S. adults 65 years and older? The, interven the intervention is one dose of PCV15. The comparison is based on the current recommendations, which are PCV13 followed by PPSV23 for immune compromised adults age 65 years and older, and one dose of PPSV23 with shared clinical decision making for PCV13 for immunocompetent or healthy adults age 65 years and older. The second PICO question for PCV15, shown in the second column, is should PCV15 be routinely recommended to U.S. adults 65 years and older in series with PPSV23? The intervention is one dose of PCV15 followed by one dose of PPSV23. The comparators are based on the current recommendations for adults 65 years and older. The first question regarding PCV20, shown in the third column, is should PCV20 be routinely recommended to adults U.S. adults 65 years and older. Again, the population is U.S. adults age 65 years or older. The intervention is one dose of PCV20, and the comparators are based on the current recommendations for adults 65 years and older. The second question regarding PCV20, shown in the last column, is should PCV20 be routinely recommended to U.S. adults 50 years and older? The population is U.S. adults 50 years or older. The intervention is one dose of PCV20, and the comparators are based on current recommendations for adults 50 years and older, which are PCV13 followed by PPSV23 use in immune-compromised adults 50 years or older, one dose of PPSV23 in adults 50 to 64 years with chronic medical conditions or immune-competent adults 65 years or older, and no vaccination among healthy adults 50 to 64 years of age. As a brief reminder, there are four evidence types for grade with type one indicating high certainty in the evidence of an outcome and type four indicating very low certainty in the evidence. Evidence top type is not measuring the quality of individual studies, but how much certainty we have in the estimates of effect across each outcome. Studies within each outcome were collectively assessed by study design, risk of bias, inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, and other considerations like publication bias, dose response, magnitude of effect, and residual confounding. For this review of evidence, we leveraged a systematic review conducted by the Norwegian Institute of Public Health that was presented to WHO's strategic advisory group of experts in April 2020, addressing similar questions regarding adult use of pneumococcal vaccines. The initial search covered literature to March 2019. We updated this search through February of 2021, searching eight databases and including studies relevant to PCV13, PCV15, PCV20, or PPSV23 efficacy or effectiveness against the critical outcomes. Additionally, we contacted manufacturers for unpublished and other relevant data. Title and abstracts were screened independently by two separate reviewers. The WHO SAGE review yielded almost 2,500 articles for review. Our updated search added 923 citations. After screening and full-text review, we identified 33 studies that evaluated vaccine efficacy or effectiveness on outcomes of interest. Seven studies evaluated PCV13, six PCV15, two PCV20, and 19 PPSV23. The studies evaluating clinical outcomes did not assess PCV15 and PCV20. Therefore, we focused on the immunogenicity studies for grade purposes, but will review the evidence on clinical outcomes as background. 
As we present the review of evidence, I will first review the evidence for the clinical outcomes by looking at PCV13 and PPSV effectiveness data against vaccine type IPD, vaccine type pneumonia, and vaccine type mortality. These are the current vaccine products licensed for use and provide the only effectiveness data on the critical outcomes. As a reminder, PCV13 and PPSV23 studies were not included in grade. Next, I'll present the evidence for PCV15 and PCV20, reviewing immunogenicity studies and serious adverse event data for both vaccines. These data will be used for grade. I will now present the evidence assessing PCV13 against clinical outcomes as background evidence for all policy questions. This table shows studies included for PCV13 efficacy and effectiveness against vaccine type IPD. We identified one RCT, the CAPITA trial, which found 75% per protocol efficacy for PCV13. The efficacy was similar when looking at a modified intent to treat analysis. Three observational studies, two of which were case control and one cohort, observed a range of 47 to 68% significant effectiveness against vaccine type IPD. However, we should note that the observational studies included adults with compromising immunocompromising conditions, whereas the CAPITA trial did not. The next outcome is on PCV13 effectiveness against vaccine type pneumonia. The, study, the studies shown here are the same as what were presented in the 2019 grade pneumococcal session. The first row shows the efficacy data from the CAPITA trial. The second study, Melophlin et al., is Pfizer's Louisville cohort specifically using a test negative design, identifying cases and controls using a serotype specific urinary, urinary antigen test. The point estimate from this study is higher than what was observed in CAPITA, but the confidence interval en encompasses that observed in CAPITA. The last study, Prado et al., comes from a much smaller cohort did not use a serotype specific urinary antigen test to detect non-invasive cases and had a non-significant estimate of VE. PCV13 type disease mortality is the third critical outcome. We have very little information for this outcome. Again, the first, outcome, the first estimate is from the CAPITA trial, which found no effectiveness against PCV13 type disease mortality. However, there were only four deaths and the study was not powered to look at mortality. The second study is a Spanish cohort that evaluated PCV13 against disease from pneumococcal pneumonia and also observed no effect from PCV13 on vaccine type disease deaths. I should note that in this cohort, 80% of those vaccinated with PCV13 had previously received PPSV23. As one of our PICO questions evaluates the use of PCV15 in series with PPSV23, we also reviewed PPSV23 effectiveness data. The following slides summarize PPSV23 efficacy and effectiveness against clinical outcomes. We identified 12 observational studies, four of which were case control, seven indirect cohort, and one perspective cohort evaluating PPSV23 against vaccine type IPD with VE estimates ranging from 27 to 77%. Pooled VE estimates from these 12 observational studies showed PPSV23 effectiveness against vaccine type IPD was 38%. We identified three observational studies, all case control designs, evaluating PPSV23 against vaccine type pneumonia. VE estimates ranged from negative two to 34%, with only one study, Suzuki et al. in the third row, observing significant effectiveness in Japanese adults 65 years and older. We identified seven studies evaluating PPSV23 against various pneumococcal related mortality outcomes. The trial by Mariama et al. shown in the first row observed a 35% higher death rate from pneumococcal pneumonia among Japanese nursing home residents in the placebo group compared to the vaccine group. The remaining studies, all cohort studies, observed varying measures of effectiveness with only one study, SU et al., observing a significant effectiveness of 32.5% using the screening method. I will now present the immunogenicity and safety data for PCV15 and PCV20, which were used for grade. 
For each study, we summarized results looking at the ratio of OPA, geometric mean titer, and percent CIRA responders, which were defined as subjects with a greater than fourfold rise in OPA GMT post vaccination compared to pre vaccination. We also summarized any point estimate values used for descriptive comparison. We have reported statistical non inferiority whenever it was assessed. If non-inferiority was not assessed, we define statistical significance as the 95% confidence interval of GMT ratio did not cross one, or the 95% confidence interval of greater than fourfold rise in OPA GMT and the intervention first comparator group did not overlap. We identified three phase two or phase three randomized controlled PCV15 immunogenicity studies in healthy adults aged 50 years or older. Ermelik et al. compared immune response to PCV15 against PCV13, shown on the top row, and against PPSV23, shown on the second row, in pneumococcal vaccine-naive adults. Compared to PCV13, higher GMT were observed for PCV15 and 7 of 13 shared serotypes. The GMT ratios were significantly higher in 5 of 13 serotypes. Percent CIR responders were greater for PCV15 in 9 of 13 serotypes, but these were non-significant. When compared to PPSV23, PCV15 had greater GMT in 12 of 13 shared serotypes found in PCV13 and was non-inferior for all 13 serotypes. PCV15 had greater percent CIR responders in 10 of 13 serotypes, 3 were significantly higher. In the phase three pivotal trial, V114019, in the second row, higher GMT were observed for five of 13 serotypes in PCV15 compared to PCV13. Non-inferiority criteria was met for all 13 shared serotypes and superiority criteria was met for serotype three. Percent sero responders were higher in five of 13 shared serotypes, but significance was only in serotype three. The study by Peterson et al. in the last row was in adults 65 years and older with previous history of PPSV23 receipt. Compared to PCV13, GMT were higher for PCV15 in 7 of 13 serotypes. Percent serotypes responders were higher in 8 of 13 shared serotypes, but none were statistically significant. PCV15 immunogenicity studies among adults with underlying conditions were also included in our review. We reviewed these data since policy questions focusing on adults 50 years and older or 65 years and older cover a population with high prevalence of underlying conditions. We identified two randomized control studies with immunogenicity data for PCV15 and adults with underlying conditions. The, the study in the top row, V114017, evaluated PCV15 use in immune competent adults 18 to 14, nine years of age. Compared to PCV13, higher GMT were observed in the PCV15 group in six of 13 shared serotypes. PCV15 had greater percent zero responders compared to the PCV13 group in six of 13 shared serotypes. Significance was observed for serotype 18C. The second study, V114018, evaluating, evaluated PCV15 in adults with HIV, observed higher GMT for 10 of 13 shared serotypes in the PCV15 group compared to PCV13. Percent serotype responders were higher in the PCV15 group for 9 of 13 shared serotypes. The two RCTs in adults with underlying conditions presented in the previous slide also evaluated PCV15 in series with PPSV23. V114017 observed higher GMT in nine of 13 shared serotypes in the PCV15 plus PPSV23 group when compared to PCV13 plus PPSV23. And V114018 observed higher GMT in 11 of 13 serotypes. In the first study, percent CIR responders were greater for PCV15 plus PPSV in five of 13 CIR types, but these were non-significant. In the second study, percent CIR responders were greater for PCV15 plus PPSV23 in 10 of 13 CIR types. A third RCT, V114016, shown in the last row, evaluated PCV15 plus PPSV23 in, adult, in healthy adults 50 years or older. Compared to PCV13 plus PPSV23, 
PCV15 plus PPSV23 had higher GMT for all 13 shared serotypes and was significantly higher for serotypes 1, 14, and 23F. PCV15 plus PPSV23 had higher percent seroresponders for 11 of 13 shared serotypes, none of which were statistically significant. Looking at the evidence for serious adverse events, we identified three trials for PCV15 in healthy adults. In each trial, less serious adverse, adverse events were observed in the PCV15 group compared to the PCV13 group, and no events were related to PCV15. Similar observations were seen in the P PCV15 trials among adults with underlying conditions. Looking at PCV15 in series with PPSV23, serious adverse events were greater in the comparator group than PCV15 group, and no events were related to PCV15. We will now review immunogenicity and safety data for PCV20. We identified two phase two or phase three randomized control studies with immunogenicity data for PCV20 in healthy adults aged 60 years and older. The phase three trial, B747107, shown in the top half of the slide, compared response to PCV20 versus PCV13, shown on the top row, and against P PPSV23, shown in the second row, in healthy adults. Compared to PCV13, slightly lower GMT were observed for PCV20 in 12 of 13 shared serotypes. However, non-inferiority criteria were, was met for all 13 shared serotypes. Percent CR responders were lower for PCV20 in 12 of 13 serotypes, and only CR type 3 was significantly lower. When compared to PPSV23, PCV20 had greater GMT in 6 of 7 shared serotypes and was non inferior for 6 of 7 serotypes. PCV20 had greater percent CR responders in 6 of 7 serotypes, all were statistically significant. PCV20 had significantly lower percent CR responders for serotype 8 compared to PPSV23. Hurley et al. compared immune response to PCV20 for, against PCV13, shown in the third row, and against PPSV23, shown on the last row, in healthy adults. Compared to PCV13, slightly lower GMT were observed for PCV20 in all 13 shared serotypes. Confidence intervals did not overlap in 4 of 13 serotypes. Percent CR responders were lower for PCV20 in 12 of 13 serotypes, however, all were non-significant. When compared to P, um, PPSV23, PCV20 had greater GMT in 6 of 7 shared serotypes. Com confidence intervals did not overlap in 3 of 6 serotypes. PCV20 had lower GMT for serotype 8 compared to PPSV23. The confidence intervals did not overlap. PCV20 had greater percent seroresponders in 6 of 7 serotypes. 2 of 6 were statistically significant. PCV20 had lower percent seroresponders for serotype 8 compared to PPSV23, but this was not significant. The phase 3 trial also evaluated immunogenicity in healthy adults 50 to 59 years compared to older adults. Comparing response to PCV20 in 50 to 59 year olds against adults 60 to 64 years of age, higher GMT were observed for those 50 to 59 years old in 15 of 20 serotypes. Non-inferiority criteria was met for all 20 serotypes. Percent seroresponders were greater for those 50 to 59 years in 18 of 20 serotypes when compared to those 60 years and older. Only one of 18 uh, serotypes showed significance. The two randomized controlled trials also eva evaluated serious adverse events. In the phase three trial among adults, serious adverse events were observed more often in the PCV20 group com when compared to the comparator group among those 60 years or older, but less often than the comparator group for those 50 to 59 years. However, confidence intervals overlap for both groups. No severe adverse events were related to PCV20. In the phase two trial by Hurley et al., more severe adverse events were observed among the comparator groups at various study time points than PCV20 groups, and no severe adverse events were related to PCV20. I will now present summary grade tables for each vaccine product. 
Based on the evidence reviewed, we will now present the summary grade tables for the PICO questions. As the evidence reviewed was the same for the set of PICO questions regarding PCV15, I will present one grade table for both PICO questions. Regarding PCV15 efficacy, we identified six randomized controlled trials with immunogenicity and safety data. The overall certainty of evidence for benefits was downgraded to two, moderate, for indirectness due to the absence of data on correlates of protection. Two of the RCTs focused on adults with underlying conditions. However, we did not downgrade the evidence because immune responses were similar compared to randomized controlled trials among healthy adults, and the inclusion of these studies strengthened our review of the evidence. The overall certainty of evidence for harms was downgraded to two, moderate, for imprecision based on small sample size in the PCV15 trial data. Therefore, the overall certainty of evidence for benefits and harms was two, moderate. Similar to PCV15, as the evidence reviewed was the same for the set of PICO questions regarding PCV20, I will present one grade table for both PICO questions. For PCV20 efficacy, we identified two randomized control trials with immunogenicity and safety data. The overall certainty of evidence for benefits was downgraded to two, moderate, for indirectness due to the absence of data on correlates of protection. The overall certainty of evidence for harms was downgraded to two, moderate, for imprecision based on small sample size in the PCV20 trial data. Therefore, the overall certainty of evidence for benefits and harms was two, moderate. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues for their tremendous help. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Farrar. Um, Dr. Kobayashi, are we going to entertain questions now or do you want to still wait until after your presentation? Okay, so uh, we'll wait um, for questions at this time. Um, and let me move on to the next uh, presentation, two presentations actually, by uh, Dr. Kobayashi. Uh, the ETR summary for age-based 15, PCV15 and PCV20 use uh, in U.S. adults and the summary and timeline. Uh, Dr. Kobayashi, please go forward. Thank you very much. Good morning. On behalf of the work group, I will present the data in work group interpretation on the age-based use of 15 and 20 valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccines in adults using the evidence to recommendation framework. The evidence to recommendation framework, or ETR, is intended to provide structure for describing information considered in moving from evidence to ACIP vaccine recommendations and transparency on the impact of additional factors on deliberations when considering recommendations. The ETR framework consists of the following seven domains, public health problem, benefits and harms, values, acceptability, feasibility, resource use, and equity. Available evidence is usually assessed for each policy question. However, given the overlap in available evidence for the four questions being considered, we reviewed the four questions in parallel for each ETR domain. In this presentation, the problem is pneumococcal disease and intervention is PCV15 or PCV20 use. As a reminder, each policy question will be compared to the current recommendation shown here. The current pneumococcal vaccine recommendation differs by risk and age group. In this presentation, I will refer to the groups who are currently recommended to routinely receive both PCV13 and PPSV23 in series as immunocompromised adults, and those who are not as immunocompetent adults. In adults aged 19 to 64 years, adults with chronic medical conditions such as alcoholism, chronic heart, liver, or lung disease, diabetes, or those who are cigarette smokers have a risk-based recommendation. I will refer to adults in this group as adults with chronic medical conditions. The two questions for PCV15 use are, should PCV15 be routinely recommended to U.S. adults 65 years and older? And should PCV15 be routinely recommended to U.S. adults 65 years and older in series with PPSV23? As you saw in the previous presentation, the difference between the two is the intervention, 
population comparison and outcomes are the same. The two questions for PCB20 use are, should PCB20 be routinely recommended to US adults 50 years and older? And should PCB20 be routinely recommended to US adults 65 years and older? Since the age of the target population is different, the comparison group is also different between the two PICA questions. The intervention and outcomes are the same. The first question is public health problem. Is pneumococcal disease of public health importance? Pneumococcal disease can be divided into invasive pneumococcal disease or IPD and non-invasive disease. IPD is less frequent, but a severe form of illness such as meningitis or bacteremia. Non-invasive disease is a more frequent form of illness such as non-bacteremic pneumonia. Among US adults aged 19 years and older, approximately 30,000 IPD cases and 3,500 IPD deaths occurred, and approximately 103,000 hospitalized pneumococcal pneumonia cases occurred in a year. The risk of pneumococcal disease increases with older age, and roughly half of these cases occurred in adults aged 65 years and older, and 80% of the cases occurred in adults 50 years and older. Introduction of PCV in children reduced vaccine-preventable pneumococcal disease burden in U.S. adults, including adults at increased risk of pneumococcal disease. After PCV13 was recommended for all adults aged 65 years and older in 2014, reductions in PCV13 type pneumococcal pneumonia incidents were documented, but no impact on PCV13 type invasive pneumococcal disease was observed at the population level despite modest PCV13 coverage achieved in this population. The most common remaining PCV13 type disease is due to SEER type 3. This graph shows the IPD incidence by serotype group in adults aged 50 to 64 years and adults 65 years and older in 2018 to 2019. The two additional PCV15 types were approximately 15% of the IPD burden. And the seven additional serotypes included in PCV20 were approximately 30% of the IPD burden. For the question, is pneumococcal disease of public health importance in adults aged 50 years and older? The work group's interpretation was yes. The next domain is benefits and harms. This domain covers several questions. How substantial are the desirable anticipated effects for vaccine type IPD, vaccine type non-bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia, and deaths from vaccine type disease? How substantial is the undesirable anticipated effect for serious adverse events? Do the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects? First, we will review evidence on PCV15. PCV15 shares 13 serotypes with PCV13, shown in yellow, and 14 serotypes with PPSV23, shown in both yellow and green. In four trials comparing the immunogenicity to PCV13, geometric mean titers or GMTs and percent seroresponders post-vaccination were higher in PCV15 recipients for some serotypes shared with PCV13. In one phase three trial, PCV15 met the non-inferiority criteria for all 13 serotypes based on GMT ratio, and serotype three met the superiority criteria. Compared to PPSV23, PCV15 met the non-inferiority criteria for all 14 shared serotypes based on GMT ratios in one phase two trial. The certainty of evidence was moderate for both comparisons. How substantial are the desirable anticipated effects of using PCV15 for all adults aged 65 years and older? The workgroup interpretation was small. This was because PCV15 contains only two additional serotypes compared to PCV13. Some workgroup members were concerned that using PCV15 alone will lose coverage for nine additional serotypes that are included in PPSV23 that is currently recommended. However, a recommendation consisting of a single vaccine may achieve higher vaccine coverage in the target population compared to the current recommendation. 
Three phase three trials compared the immunogenicity of PCV15 to PCV13, both given in series, with PPSV23. GMTs and percent zero responders were higher in recipients who received PCV15 for some shared serotypes. The certainty of evidence was moderate. Regarding use of PCV15 in series with PPSV23 in adults aged 65 years and older, the work group determined that the desirable anticipated effects was small because PCV15 contains two more serotypes compared to PCV13. In studies that reported the proportion of serious adverse events after PCV15 use alone or in series with PPSV23, none of the studies reported any SAEs that were associated with the vaccines. The certainty of evidence was moderate for both comparisons. Therefore, the undesirable anticipated effects of using PCV15 in adults aged 65 years and older alone or in series with PPSV23 was determined to be minimal. Balancing the desirable and undesirable effects, the work group determined that using PCV15 for adults aged 65 years and older alone or in series with PPSV23 were more favorable, though the added benefit was considered to be small. Next, we will review evidence on PCV20. PCV20 shares 13 serotypes with PCV13 shown in yellow. In trials that used PPSV23 as a comparator, responses to the seven additional serotypes shown in blue were compared. In a phase two trial, GMT and percent C responders in PCV20 recipients were lower for some serotypes shared with PCV13. However, in a phase three trial, PCV20 met non-inferiority criteria for all 13 shared serotypes by GMT ratio. Compared to PPSV23, GMT and percent zero responders were higher in PCV20 recipients for some shared serotypes in a phase two trial. In a phase three trial, PCV20 met non-inferiority criteria for six of seven shared serotypes based on GMT ratio. Non-inferiority was not met for serotype eight. There are more serial responders in the PCV20 arm for six of seven serotypes. Certainty of evidence was moderate. When comparing the immunogenicity of PCV20 in adults 50 to 59 years old to 60 to 64 years old, non-inferiority criteria was met for all 20 serotypes in a phase three trial. The work group determined that the benefits of PCV20 use in adults aged 50 years and older was large. Some work group members expressed concerns about the lower immunogenicity observed after PCV20 vaccination compared to PCV13 vaccination. However, the clinical significance is unknown and non-inferiority criteria were largely met. The work group agreed that a recommendation with a single vaccine will likely improve coverage and some members thought that lowering the age-based recommendation will improve coverage in adults aged 50 to 64 years who currently have indications. The work group interpretation was split between moderate and large for the de desirable anticipated effects of using PCV20 for all adults aged 65 years and older. While the impact from the cost-effectiveness analysis was deemed to be large, because the target population is the same as the current age-based recommendation and because of the immunogenicity data, some work group members felt that the additional impact from this age-based recommendation alone may not be large. In studies that reported the proportion of serious adverse events after PCV20 vaccination compared to PCV13 or PCV13 and PPSV23 series, there were no vaccine-related serious adverse events reported. Certainty of evidence was moderate. Therefore, the undesirable anticipated effects from use of PCV20 in adults aged 50 years and older and those aged 65 years and older were determined to be minimal. Although there were differences in the interpretation of the benefits in use of PCV20 for adults aged 50 years and older and 65 years and older, balancing the desirable and undesirable effects, the work group determined that both interventions were favorable. 
This is the summary of the workgroup interpretation for benefits and harms for each policy question. Between the four policy questions, the difference was in the interpretation of benefits. Next is values and preferences. Does the target population feel that the desirable effects are large relative to undesirable effects? Is there important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcomes? We performed literature search on published US studies in adults that assessed people's beliefs, attitudes, and intentions related to pneumococcal vaccines in the last five years. However, there were very limited published data and only one of four studies shown here targeted nationally representative sample of US adults. Awareness of pneumococcal vaccines was lower compared to influenza vaccines and may be variable by age or race and ethnicity. Awareness of pneumonia, which was used as an example of disease that the vaccine prevents, was high, but perceived susceptibility was low. However, none of these studies were on values and preferences of PCV15 or PCV20 use, and the findings may not be generalizable to the entire US population. For this domain, the workgroup interpretation was the same for all four questions being considered. Do adults feel that desirable effects from vaccination are large relative to undesirable effects? The workgroup interpretation was probably yes. This was because pneumococcal vaccines have been available and have achieved moderate coverage in the target population and because pneumococcal disease can result in serious consequences. Is there important uncertainty about or variability in how much adults value the main outcomes? The work group determined probably not important uncertainty or variability. This is the summary of the work group interpretation on values and preferences. The next domain is acceptability. Is the option acceptable to key stakeholders? We reviewed data from three different surveys. There were two healthcare provider surveys. One targeted primary care physicians on a shared clinical decision-making recommendation for PCV13. Another survey by Pfizer targeted primary care providers, including non-physicians. The latter asked responders to rank hypothetical vaccine recommendations for adults aged 65 years and older in adults aged 19 to 64 years with underlying conditions. The third survey targeted members of the Association of Immunization Managers, or AIM, which primarily targeted immunization program managers or directors. Responders expressed that the current shared clinical decision making for PCV13 use was confusing and preferred a simplified pneumococcal vaccine recommendation, potentially the same recommendation across age and risk groups. There were mixed responses on the use of PCV in series with PPSV23. Routine PCV and PPSV23 use was the most preferred among provided option in the survey by Pfizer. Implementation and communication challenges and health equity concerns were expressed in the AIM survey, since a recommendation with two different vaccines requires capturing the correct vaccination history or having adults return to complete the vaccine series. There are also mixed responses on lowering the age-based recommendation. Respondents were supportive of lowering the age-based recommendation in Pfizer survey. In the AIM survey, respondents expressed concerns regarding communication associated with changing the target population for the age-based recommendation and lower coverage in adults aged 50 to 64 years who are less likely to seek primary health care compared to older adults and a potential for disparity by insurance status. Is recommending PCV15 for persons aged 65 years and older acceptable to key stakeholders? The workgroup interpretation was probably yes. Is recommending PCV15 for persons aged 65 years and older in series with PPSV23 acceptable to key stakeholders? The workgroup interpretation was varies. PCV has been recommended in series with PPSV23, so 
the work group thought that the intervention was feasible. However, the work group acknowledged that there are some more uh, there are more logistical challenges associated with the use of two different vaccines in series. Is recommending PCV20 for persons aged 50 years and older acceptable to key stakeholders? While changing the age-based recommendation may be associated with some initial challenges with implementation, some workgroup members thought that lowering the age may provide an opportunity to improve coverage in adults younger than age 65 with underlying conditions. In addition, the workgroup determined that a recommendation consisting of one vaccine is more acceptable than the current recommendation. Therefore, the workgroup interpretation was probably yes. Is recommending PCV20 for persons aged 65 years and older acceptable to key stakeholders? The workgroup interpretation was yes. This is a summary of workgroup interpretation for acceptability. Next is resource use. Is the option a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources? As a reminder, the cost-effectiveness analysis presented today assessed the cost-effectiveness of age-based recommendations combined with risk-based recommendations in younger adults. For example, option one here looks at the combined impact of PCV15 use for all adults aged 65 years and older and for adults aged 19 to 64 years with chronic medical conditions or immunocompromising conditions. The same applies for the two PCV20 questions. Options were compared to the current pneumococcal vaccine recommendations. In the base case scenario, recommending PCV15 only at age 65 years and in younger adults with underlying conditions cost $158,000 per quality saved. The estimates for adding PPSV23 to PCV15 in the second column is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio compared to PCV15 only. So adding PPSV23 to PCV15 resulted in $463,000 per quality saved in addition to using PCV15 alone. The two scenarios using PCV20 only were both cost savings. When we assumed indirect effects from pediatric vaccination, the interventions cost more per quality saved compared to the base case. We then assumed that all PCVs had no vaccine effectiveness against serotype 3 disease. Use of PCV15 alone was dominated, meaning that this option was more costly and less effective compared to the current recommendation. We then assumed that PCV15 had improved vaccine effectiveness against serotype 3 disease compared to PCV13 or PCV20. The costs per quality saved were lower than the base case. Based on these findings, the work group determined that recommending PCV15 for adults aged 65 years and older was probably not a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. And recommending PCV15 in series with PPSV23 to adults aged 65 years and older was not. Recommending PCV20 for persons 50 years and older and for persons 65 years and older were both determined to be a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. This is a summary of the workgroup interpretation for resource use. Next is equity. What would be the impact on health equity? Certain groups or settings, such as older adults, adults with certain underlying medical conditions, black population, American Indian and Alaska Native population, adults living in impoverished census tracts are known to have disproportionately higher burden of pneumococcal disease. Indirect effects from pediatric PCV vaccination reduced disparities in vaccine type pneumococcal disease in these higher risk groups. This graph shows the IPD incidence by serotype group in adults aged 65 years and older by race in 2017 to 2018. Although the IPD incidence in blacks shown in the middle is higher than other racial groups, 
The difference is largely from non-vaccine types shown in green. Therefore, while use of PCV15 and PCV20 in adults may reduce racial disparities by preventing additional serotypes shown in orange or gray, it may not eliminate racial disparities in invasive pneumococcal disease burden. In adults age 50 years and older, IPD incidence from 2011 to 2019 in Alaska natives was approximately three times higher compared to non-Alaska natives in Alaska, and IPD incidence in 2019 in the American Indian population was approximately four times higher compared to the general U.S. population. Additional serotypes included in PCV15, but not in PCV13, comprised 6 to 13 percent of the IPD burden, and additional serotypes included in PCV20 comprise 28 to 35 percent of the IPD burden. Therefore, these new vaccines may reduce the higher disease burden in this population. We then reviewed data on vaccine coverage. According to the 2018 National Health Interview Survey data, pneumococcal vaccine coverage in adults aged 19 to 64 years with risk-based indication has been low compared to adults 65 years and older with age-based recommendations. By race and ethnicity, Hispanics had significantly lower coverage compared to whites. This graphs look at vaccine coverage among Medicare beneficiaries aged 65 years and older based on Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Claims data. The left graph shows PPSV23 vaccine coverage by race and ethnicity in 2013, when PPSV23 was routinely recommended. The right graph looks at the proportion of beneficiaries that received both PCV13 and PPSV23 in 2018, when both vaccines were routinely recommended. These graphs show that the proportion receiving the recommended vaccines are lower when two vaccines were recommended and disproportionately affected certain race or ethnicity groups. Lastly, we reviewed the potential impact of lowering the age-based recommendation to age 50 from age 65. According to the 2019 National Health Interview Survey, approximately 15% of adults aged 18 to 64 years compared to 1% of adults aged 65 years and older were uninsured. And among age, adults aged 18 to 64 years, groups who were more likely to be uninsured were those who were poor or near poor and Hispanics. Section 317 funded vaccines are options to provide recommended vaccines to those who are uninsured. Lowering the age-based recommendation may improve vaccine coverage in populations with higher prevalence of conditions that increase the risk of pneumococcal disease before 60, uh, age 65. This figure shows the proportion of individuals with non-immunocompromising conditions that increase the risk of pneumococcal disease by racial group. The proportion in the black population is shown as the black solid line, and the black non-black population is shown as the black dashed line. With increasing age until around age 75, the proportion of adults with underlying conditions is higher in the black population. The work group determined that recommending PCB15 to adults aged 65 years and older will probably have no impact on health equity. A simplified recommendation may improve coverage, but by using PCB15 alone, we will be losing coverage for nine serotypes included in PPSV23 that is currently recommended for this group. The work group determined that recommending PCV15 in series with PPSV23 would probably reduce equity since a vaccine recommendation with two different vaccines is more likely to disadvantage those with challenges with healthcare access. The work group determined that recommending PCV20 in adults aged 50 years and older may probably increase equity. While lowering the age-based recommendation to 50 years and older may potentially disadvantage adults aged 50 to 64 years who are uninsured, the work group determined that equity may be increased from improved vaccine coverage from a single vaccine recommendation and improving vaccine coverage in groups that have higher proportion of underlying conditions before age 65 years. 
the work group determined that recommending PCB20 in persons aged 65 years and older will probably increase health equity. Some work group members thought that introduction of any effective intervention is, li is more likely to disadvantage those with limited access. However, the work group determined that a simplified recommendation may improve overall vaccine coverage. This is a summary of the work group interpretation for equity. The last domain is feasibility. Are the options feasible to implement? The work group determined that since PCV has been used in series with PPSV23, the recommendation of using PCV15 in series with PPSV23 is feasible. However, the work group acknowledged that this intervention may disadvantage people with challenges with access to vaccines. On the other hand, a recommendation that consists of a single vaccine dose is easier to implement and is likely to achieve, vaccine co achieve coverage in a larger population. The work group determined that recommending PCV15 in adults aged 65 years and older, PCV20 for adults aged 50 years and older, and PCV20 for adults aged 65 years and older are feasible to implement. And determined that recommending PCV15 in series with PPSV23 in adults aged 65 years and older was probably feasible. This is the summary of work group interpretation for feasibility. And this is the summary of work group interpretation for all ATR domains for each policy question. The main differences in the interpretation were in the domains of benefits, acceptability, resource use, and equity. For the question, should Merck PCV15 be recommended for persons aged 65 years and older? The work group determined that the balance between desirable and undesirable consequences is closely balanced or uncertain. The cost effectiveness analysis showed some benefit in preventing disease. However, some work group members were concerned about losing coverage for nine serotypes by not using the vaccine with PPSV23. For the question, should Merck PCV15 be recommended for persons aged 65 years and older in series with PPSV23, the work group members were split between undesirable consequences probably outweigh desirable consequences in most settings and the balance between desirable and undesirable consequences is closely balanced or uncertain. While use of PCV15 in series with PPSV23 is likely to prevent additional pneumococcal disease, the added benefit was considered to be small. Some work group members thought that the potential undesirable consequences related to resource use, feasibility, and equity probably outweigh the desirable consequences. However, given that some adults currently receive PCV13 in series with PPSV23, the work group did not reach a consensus on whether these potential undesirable outcomes would outweigh the desirable consequences in most settings. For the questions, should Pfizer PCV20 be recommended for persons aged 50 years and older? And should Pfizer PCV20 be recommended for persons aged 65 years and older? The work group determined that desirable consequences clearly outweigh undesirable consequences in most settings. Currently, additional cost effectiveness analyses are underway by other groups. Those results will be reviewed by the work group. Additionally, the work group will review GRADE and ETR for risk-based recommendation for use of PCV15 and PCV20 in younger adults who are not targeted by the age-based recommendation. A summary of the additional cost effectiveness analyses and GRADE and ETR for risk-based recommendation for use of PCV15 and PCV20 will be presented at the September ACIP meeting. The policy options on age and risk-based recommendations on PCV15 and PCV20 use in adults will be further refined and will be presented for vote at the October ACIP meeting if both are licensed. The options for PCV15 and PCV20 use will be reviewed separately. The questions for the ACIP members are, are there other age-based policy options we should be considering for grade and ETR? 
Are there policy options we should not be considering for a vote? Are there additional data the committee would like to see before deciding on policy options? The two PCB15 and PCB20 questions presented today are shown here. I'd like to thank the many groups and individuals for their contribution to this work, including those who I may not have captured here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kobayashi, for those presentations. Um, I'm going to ask um, a representative from Merck uh, if they'd like to make a comment at this point. Um, please go forward. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Dr. Help. Can you hear me okay? Dr. Oh, we, we can, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. I, uh, my name is Rick Halp. I'm the lead for the Infectious Disease and Vaccines Global Medical Affairs at Merck. Uh, I'd like to thank the ACIP for allowing us an opportunity to make the public comment based on the data presentation today. I have a few comments I'll try to make in just a few minutes. Um, we noted some inconsistencies in the effectiveness assumption inputs and the disease outcomes reported in the model. I would note particularly the substantial difference in health outcomes averted noted between PCV15 and PCV20, which appear inconsistent with the current epidemiological data. Uh, we will continue to work with the CDC and the work group regarding the assumptions and strategies that have been um, examined in the model. Uh, I, it, as noted by Dr. Lee in her question, we also would suggest that the health economic model, starting with a cohort of adults at age 19 and discounting over time, in a way, invalidates everything concluded about adults 50 years of age and older today. I may be incorrect, but I think this implies that the first vaccination of adults at 50 years of age wouldn't start until 2052, and therefore the model analysis doesn't really address or answer the policy questions about vaccinating adults 50 years of age today. Another specific component within the model um, is the assumption on waning immunity. Uh, various scenarios estimate the duration of protection of 20 to 50 years for conjugate vaccines and only 10 to 15 years for the PPSV23. Uh, these assumptions are, create a really strong bias against PPSV in the model, particularly in the 50 to 64 years of age group. Given that there's really no scientific data supporting the long waning uh, or, or lack of waning assumptions for conjugate vaccines, uh, we respectfully request that the worker revisit the waning immunity assumptions. The analysis also used epidemiology data from a period of widespread use of PPSV23 in adults. Removal of PPSV23 from the recommendation as suggested by these analyses may result in reemergence of the unique serotypes protected by PPSV23. And I'll note that they still account for 8 to 13 percent of IPD and older adults today. And also, as noted in the epidemiology presentation, serotype 3 remains a significant unmet medical need and is the most common vaccine serotype causing disease in the U.S. Given the higher immunological response seen against serotype 3 with V114, uh, PCV15, it is likely that PCV15 may be the best opportunity to address this serotype. Although certainly more data will be needed to establish the clinical impact of PCV15 on serotype 3 disease over time, we are concerned that the clinical trial results for PCV15 were really not given adequate consideration in the evidence to recommendation framework. Um, additionally, the potential impact of immunogenicity creep against the common serotype seen um, with the higher valent PCVs is an important consideration that, that the evidence to our uh, recommendation framework does not adequately address. Um, and then the, the new age-based recommendation includes individuals with immunocompromising and chronic medical conditions. Uh, these risk groups are known to have lower immune response as well as lower vaccine efficacy compared to the healthy population. Therefore, a single PCV age-based recommendation may offer suboptimal protection and increase the risk of breakthrough disease in these populations. Certainly, there's ample scientific evidence that shows a sequential recommendation of PCV followed by PPSV23 offers higher immunological responses compared to a single dose of PCV and would continue to support the sequential recommendation. And then finally, we would note that the broad serotype coverage 
is really not enough when assessing conjugate pneumococcal vaccines. It's also the quality of the vaccine immune response that's a really important consideration to, to achieve the appropriate clinical impact and optimize the public health benefit. Uh, we at Merck remain committed to pneumococcal disease prevention globally. We're very proud of our vac pneumococcal vaccines pipeline that's potential to address a significant unmet medical need, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, Dr. Kobayashi, can we ask you to put up the question that you wanted the ACIP voting members to? That, oops, oops. One more. There we are. Okay. Um, so um, let me open this up now for questions, uh, for comments um, <coughs> from the group. Um, Dr. Gluckman, I, I see your hand is up. Did you wish to make a comment or a question? Yeah. Um, and, thank, uh, you, uh, thank you for being uh, patient. Uh, question. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, this is Bob Gluckman. I'm the representative from AHIP. Um, I'd like the uh, work group to consider uh, being uh, specific about its recommendations in vaccine naive individuals versus those individuals previously immunized with PCV 13 or PPSV 23 or both. Um, the presentations today really all focused and um, or had the perspective of of recommendations for vaccine naive individuals, but I think we need to have some clarity around people previously vaccinated. Thank you for that comment. Dr. Freihofer. Sandra Freihofer, American Medical Association, speaking as a practicing physician. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, it, we went into such great detail and I greatly also appreciate um, the comments from uh, Merck representatives. Um, on the June 8th licensing of the PCV20, uh, I wondered about the cost of that vaccine as compared with the PCV13 and when is that available uh, on the market? Um, and um, how does it affect, uh, affect insurance coverage for PCV in general? Does anyone know those answers? I think that's for Burke. Um, hi, this is Dr. Kobayashi. So, um, you know, the information we have is the um, what was presented in the cost effectiveness analysis model based on earlier communication with uh, Pfizer. But in terms of, you know, what is going to happen about, you know, the actual um, cost and then, you know, how insurance will cover it, you know, uh, I, I don't think that that will not, uh, we will not have that information at this point. So um, let me see if, if a representative from Pfizer would like to comment on any of those questions. I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, um, we will need to look into that. Uh, very good, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you so much. I um, have a few questions. Um, so, well, first of all, I just have to say that was like comprehensive and really well done. Uh, this is a super complex topic and I think you efficiently addressed as much as you could in um, today's series of presentations. So thank you for that. Um, I, I'm going to focus on the last one, which is what are the additional data that we'd like to see? And then also maybe perhaps just comment on the overall interpretation, because um, I'm walking away with a slightly different interpretation, perhaps, than the final consensus by the work group. Um, first, you know, I, I'm struck by the fact that it looks like 78% of PCV13 disease is due to serotypes 3 and 4. Um, and, you know, while we've talked about serotype 3 in the past, I would like to understand more about whether or not serotype 4 is, um, has been consistently sort of in the 12 to 20% range or if there are changes that we're starting to see um, and what that, you know, um, what, what that impact would be. And that gets to my second point, which is um, I really feel like I need better data on um, correlates of protection. And this is where I'm fundamentally struggling. The grade of the grade was framed around immunogenicity because of the lack of information about efficacy and effectiveness. Um, but I also think because the grade now focuses on immunogenicity as the outcome, all of the subsequent um, judgments about certainty and impact are influenced by immunogenicity. Um, and I don't have a good sense of how that correlates with efficacy. And that gets to the serotype three differences potentially between the two vaccines in terms of immunogenicity 
I also am concerned, I'll just articulate about the lower, um, uh, perhaps slightly lower uh, immune response, even though it, it met non-inferiority criteria, uh, because it may erode potential gains that are uh, gotten by the additional serotypes if, for example, we lose ground on serotype three plus or minus serotype four. And so I do think that that uncertainty needs to be reflected a bit more in the grade and the ETR. Um, and then, sorry, and then I'll just make a, a couple of final comments and then I'll stop <laughs> and let you respond. Um, the, that was in the grade. I think also that probably should be reflected in the modeling. My assumption about the modeling is that it um, is kind of like a, you know, an all or none uh, adjusted for the overall presumed um, efficacy, I think. But because of that, um, my, my own uncertainty, but you can educate me about how that immunogenicity and that response correlates with efficacy and particularly regarding pneumonia. Since that has been the focus for adult vaccination, um, uh, given that is the difference really between the conjugate vaccines and the polysaccharide vaccines, um, I worry that the differences reflected in the model may not be as stark as they're currently presented. And then finally, my last com comment slash question is, you know, I, I generally like the idea of lowering the age. You know, I, I like thinking about this new 50-year-old vaccination platform where you get softer pneumococcal and a colonoscopy. Um, but I also have questions about what that would mean in terms of do we need a booster dose at a later point in time and if that is being considered. Um, and I'll just state at the, um, as a final statement that I think childhood vaccination is still going to be the most effective way to protect adults based on all the evidence we've accumulated with PCV7 and 13. So I still think that is going to be the optimal strategy, but recognize the importance of direct protection of adults. Um, thanks. If you can answer any of those questions, I'd appreciate it. Uh, thanks for your questions. I can I can try to answer the question about um, the serotype four prevalence. So it uh, among adults uh, 19 to 49 and 50 to 64, it has been increasing more in recent years. This hasn't been um, it hasn't been that high previously. So this there's definitely a market increase, especially among 19 to 49 year olds starting around 2017. So we'll can continue to keep track of that, but this is a more recent uh, occurrence, and it primarily occurred among uh, homeless individuals too, and in, within that population in select Western states. And um, hi, uh, this is Dr. Kobayashi, and thank you very much about um, other comments about you know, for example, the model inputs um, that was also expressed by um, uh, the representative from um, Merck. Um, but you know that that is you know part of the reason why we are uh, there are also additional cost effectiveness analyses and then uh, as um, I mentioned earlier uh, even for um, the model that was uh, presented today we are uh, planning on looking at a cohort of uh, older adults and then uh, present the um, different models at uh, the September ACIP meeting, um, hoping that that would you know, give us an opportunity to address some of the uncertainties uh, in the data and see how those uh, differences in inputs might impact the, um, the results. Thank you. And just, I mean, to, for, to, be un to understand explicitly, what are the assumptions of the work group about how immunogenicity correlates with efficacy is it like a simple straight assumption or are there you know, shades of gray that allow for you know, this potential? I, and, and again, I'm concerned uh, primarily because you know, I would have thought three and four, we would have reasonable protection, but I'm not exactly sure um, you know, why things are changing. Right, um, so the work group um, was actually split in terms of the interpretation, especially when we reviewed the immunogenicity results um, uh, for uh, people PCV 13, I mean, excuse me, uh, PCV 20 uh, compared to PCV 13. Um, but uh, given that the uh, non inferiority results were met, you know, for this model, uh, we applied the same vaccine effectiveness uh, across PCV, uh, the PCVs. But uh, when, you know, the next step is to look specifically at younger adults um, with underlying conditions. So with that, we are hoping to have further discussions about, you know, how would the immunogenicity uh, results translate uh, to actual um, effectiveness, uh, especially for PCV20. We don't have um, data specifically targeting adults with immunocompromising conditions. So um, we're seeing that as an opportunity to take a closer look at those 
findings, um, especially since even within the work group, uh, we had uh, different opinions. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. Um, Dr. Riddle. Okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you for the presentations this morning, very informative. Earlier this week, I received a letter from the president of the National Association of Hispanic Nurses relative to the pneumococcal vaccine. I, I passed that on to ACIP staff, but specifically the National Association of Hispanic Nurses is strongly urging the committee to consider expanding access to the pneumococcal vaccines. The benefit is both to the recipient as well as an indirect vaccine benefit for the non-vaccinated population. And three specific points, the Hispanic Nurse Association supports expansion of the recommended age range to include those 50 and over. They support a change in current language from pneumococcal vaccines being a shared clinical decision to a full recommendation. And finally, they wish to ensure access to those in the Hispanic community and to increase efforts to reduce, reduce health inequities related to vaccines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Riddle. And uh, this is uh, Amanda Cohn. We'll make sure that all of the ACAP members uh, see that uh, letter as well. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Um, Dr. Paling. Hi, this is Kathy Paling, and I wanted to um, address some of the questions. Dr. Freihofer asked about insurance coverage, and it is my understanding that a formal recommendation is an important component for insurance to cover vaccines, and that is one of the reasons the work group has prioritized a timely um, recommendation. The second, I wanted to um, thank uh, Dr. Lee about her insightful questions about immunogenicity and efficacy. And this is one of the challenges that the work group has um, having to confront because we have immunogenicity data and we don't have efficacy data. And so what does that mean? And without very clear correlates of protection, you're right, there is some uncertainty. And there have been lots of discussions about serotype three in particular, because when you look at the um, absolute uh, geometric mean titers, they're among the lowest of your different serotypes. And so um, we don't know. And so the sensitivity analysis was being done to try to um, explain the uncertainty that we have. And the differences in opinion were about if by adding additional serotypes and re slightly reducing your um, geometric mean titer, but still meeting the non-inferiority, where do you hit? And that's part of the challenges that the work group is confronting. And I hope that explanation is helpful. Thank you for that comment. Dr. Daly. Um, yeah, thanks so much. I, I want to highlight something that Dr. Lee mentioned, but that um, um, that maybe maybe in, with the number of questions that she brought up, we, we haven't sort of come back to address, which is um, uh, in terms of additional data, you know, I'm, I, I do think that in general, age-based recommendations may result in higher immunization coverage than risk-based strategies um, because busy PCPs, it, it's hard for them to sort of always see the risk and screen for the risk. But, but I do want to have additional data if available about duration of immunity because if there's vaccination with a conjugate vaccine at age 50 or 51, um, you know, I'd, I'd like additional data available about duration of protection for those who might be 65 and 70. So what's the, what's, what are the assumptions around duration of protection? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the voting members or liaisons? I'm not seeing any. Uh, Dr. Koyashi, anything to add? Nope. Okay. 
Thank you. Oh, uh, Dr. Talbot, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to make a comment regarding the I mean, just the the concern about vaccinating at 50 versus 65. So there there may be a need for further immunization later in life, but we have found that if you immunize people at 50 instead of 65, they actually have a better immune response as immune senescence starts earlier for different people and can be as early even younger than 50, I hate to say that out loud. But um, so those with comorbid conditions probably have some immune senescence at 50 and it's better to vaccinate then than later. Um, so I think it's a very good question for us to look at how much later after 50 would they need to be boosted again? But I think one of the advantages of the conjugate vaccine is the fact that it is boostable, that you can actually um, improve the immune response with further immunizations, unlike a polysaccharide vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Are there any other comments or questions from the voting members? Any from the liaisons? I'm not seeing any. Very good. Dr. Cohn, do you have any other comments for the group? I just want to thank everyone for participating in this uh, long two and a half day meeting and uh, let everyone know that we will be having a uh, uh, an ACIP meeting um, likely uh, sometime uh, in September before the October meeting. Um, and we will determine that date uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks and um, send out uh, an update through the ACIP uh, listserv that you can sign up for on the ACIP website. Um, so look out for that. We are hoping to give people plenty of time notice um, uh, and there certainly could be an unscheduled um, meeting uh, between now and that time around COVID vaccines. But as of now, there are no additional meetings. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, thank you all very much for participating in this meeting. Um, and uh, again, my thanks and gratitude for being allowed to serve on the committee uh, these seven years. Uh, good luck, and uh, I hope to see you all in the future. Take care. The meeting is now ended.